Hello everyone. So we have been practicing joints for the past however many weeks, months, and now it is time to put it into some practice. So what we're going to learn is some basic frame construction. So on here, we have got four joints that I covered in previous videos, and we're going to learn how to cut this from start to finish in this four part series. Let's go. Okay, so this video is going to be split up into a few different sections, chunks, whatever. I don't know how many it's going to be, don't know how long they're going to take. I'm just going to see how I get on. Also, for this frame, I'm writing a furniture and cabinet making magazine, like an accompanying article, I suppose. So if you're here as a result of reading that article, hello. And if you're already a viewer of mine and you're interested in reading that article, I will put a thing onto my social media as of when it has been released. So this is how I would build the frame. Let's get in close. Okay, so these are the plans that I'm going to be following when building this frame. These are downloadable from my website, so I'll put a link in the top right corner for that, up around here. So you can go to my website, free to download, and yeah, nice and easy to follow. So the first thing I'm gonna do on here is number the components on the drawing, and then I will draw that onto my components here. So logically, I'll just do it clockwise. One, two, three, four like that. And then what I'm gonna do is just lay out those components as I have on the drawing here. So I've got two components here at 450 millimeters long, and I've got two at 300 millimeters. Now these components here are made of beach, and what I've noticed is that they have a nice sort of color gradient to them. So they start with pink on here, and they go a little bit white on one side. So I'm gonna orientate these so all the white is on the outside, because if this was an actual picture frame or something like that, for example, it might look a bit weird if you have that gradient on all three sides, and then on one of them, it's on the inside. So pay attention to that if this was an actual project. Obviously a joint frame doesn't matter, but the thought is there. So that's how it's gonna to go together, and we're gonna label this one, two, three, four. Okay, so they're all numbered, so now I'm not going to get one and three mixed up, I'm not going to get two and four mixed up. And what we need to do now is draw the face sides and the face edges. And these two edges is what we're going to be referencing all of our tools off, whether that's a square, marking gauge, that's the only two off the top of my head I can think of. You have a choice of which side you orientate these. If we put the face side and face edge mark on the outside of all of these components, so like this, like this, and like this, so you've got a face side on the front, face side on the outside. It means that when we assemble this frame, it's gonna guarantee that it is square on the outside. Whereas if we put the face side on the inside, so pretend I didn't number these, if we swap them around like that, so you've got the face side mark on here, 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 and here, it means that the inside of this frame is going to guarantee to be square. So you've got to choose the right application for this. If you're doing a picture frame, for example, you want to guarantee that the inside of this is square because then you're going to be fitting glass into it. Whereas if you're making a bit of furniture for the corner of a room, for example, you want the outside of it to be perfectly square. The inside might not be as important unless you're fitting drawers, for example. So. This is why you've got to look at it by a case by case basis. Work out if you need to prioritize the outside or the inside being square. These have all been machined really precisely with a planar thicknesser circular saw, so they are spot on. Doesn't really matter too much which edge I reference from, but if you were dimensioning this timber by hand, you're gonna have small differences in there. And that is where you'd really need to rely on marking from the face side and the face edge. So I'm gonna do it on the outside because I want the outside to be square. So the first thing we're gonna do here is look at the drawing. We are going to scratch the shoulder lines for the bridle joint, half lap joint, dovetail halving joint, and through mortise and tenon joint. And to mark these shoulder lines, what I'm gonna do is take away components two and three, and then I'm going to put one onto component four. I've got a square around the back edge here, referencing off my face side, which is on the outside here. And on the end here, I'm gonna leave it overhanging. So the end grain on this bottom component is sitting proud of this component by around a millimeter, half a millimeter or so. So that's on there. I'm gonna take that away without moving it. I'm gonna get a knife and do a really light mark on there. Okay, and I'm gonna do exactly the same. So component three on the bottom here, I'm going to reference the square off the face side, off the face edge, sorry. Get on here so it's overhanging a little bit and then scratch that back. I am a left-handed, so this is not easy because I'm now doing this right-handed. So nice light mark in there. And there we go, that is the shoulder scratched on component four. 
Now what you don't want to do now is do exactly the same on component two because the amount you overhang this by is going to vary ever so slightly. And in doing so, it means that these shoulder lines may not be in line with one another. So when it comes to assembling the frame, I'll exaggerate it, it might end up sort of skewing off like that, for example, because if the shoulders on here are longer than that one, you're obviously putting together a, a I can't remember the shape, my geometry is awful. I know what a square is nowadays. <laughs> which is quite useful for furniture making. But yeah, don't do that. What we're gonna do is simply put the components together, get them flush on one end, and then put a little mark on component two, exactly where component four lines up. So one there and one there. And there we go. So now I can get a square on the face edge of component two, put my knife in the mark that I've just put on there, slide the square up to it, and then do some light drags back. Okay, shoulder lines marked on components four and component two, and then when we assemble that, it's going to be lovely and parallel, which is always good. Now looking at the drawing, I can see that these components sit in 50 millimeters from the edge here, so about two inches. So I'm gonna measure in 50 millimeters, put a nice precise pencil mark on there with a really, really sharp pencil, and square a line back. And then I'm going to do exactly the same on the other side here, because this is inset 50 millimeters as well. Okay, and exactly the same. Instead of drawing it on component three now, I'm just going to translate that across. So get it flush on one end, little mark there, little mark there, and square them back. So there we go. Now those two components are going to be in line, and those components are going to be in line, so we're going to get a nice square frame. And now what we're going to do is square these shoulder lines around all four sides on both of these components. And when you're doing this, you can get access to all four sides of this component by using only the two faces of the face side and face edge. Get access to that side, that side, that side, and that side. So when you're squaring it round, make sure the square is hitting your face side and your face edge. And what you can do to make this nice and accurate is put your knife in the previous knife line, right on the corner there, slide the square up to it, and just drag back. Okay, so I've just marked out the top of the first component. I'm just checking that all the corners here line up perfectly, which they have. You have really got to take your time with this. And it's worth mentioning at this point, instead of using a knife, if the end grain of this is perfectly square, so you've got a really good table saw that you're able to get that off, or a shooting board, and these components are exactly the same length, and by exactly I mean literally spot on, you can't feel any difference between them, you can use a marking gauge to scratch these shoulder lines all the way around makes it a little bit easier, but if your shooting board, if your table saw is a little bit off, if you use a marking gauge for that and say that the end grain is skewed slightly, you can see that it would follow the end grain, all of these shoulder lines will be out of line, and when the frame goes together, it's not gonna be square. So that is why I do it with a knife, because you just get much more control over it. I can choose where those shoulders are, I know that it's square around the component, even if the end grain isn't square, you just get more control from it. So I'm gonna get the remaining three of these all squared rounds, and I will see you on the other side. Okay, so those are all squared around all four sides now on all four corners. And I think what I'm gonna do here, just so I know whereabouts these components are gonna nest into here, I'm just gonna put the square up against the pencil line I've already drawn on here, and then just do another mark on the other side of them. And this will make things a little bit neater later on because it means when we're scratching marking gauge lines on the edge of here, we're not scratching it like all the way along. We kind of have some rough boundaries to work to. The first joint we are going to do is the easy half lap in the bottom left here. So let's get rid of that component, we don't need it. Now what we're gonna do, when we're marking out this half lap, we're gonna mark out the bridle joint on the top here simultaneously, because again, that's gonna keep everything in alignment when we knock it together. So I'm gonna get these together, and we've obviously already got our lines here that line up perfectly, and I'm gonna change these top lines into knife marks because eventually these are going to be waste. So get the square on the edge, I'm gonna start with component three, put the knife into that pencil line, and then score a nice mark going back. And then getting the ends flush again, I'm going to transfer that knife line. It's obviously dead on the pencil line here, but it's always good to be sure. So knife in there now, slide the square up and drag back. Okay, and then to nest the half lap into that, what I'm gonna do, I reckon, is flip it around this way. I'm gonna reference my square off the face edge. I'm gonna put the knife into that line there, slide the square up to it. So that now I know that that square is dead on the knife line that I've just scratched in there. I'm going to put component four up against that, take away the square, and then hold down component four and give it a really, really light mark on the other side here. There we go, so knife line on there, and then again, I can transfer that across to component one. So get the edges flush, and then transfer that knife line up, so a little poke, 
get the square knife into that poke mark, poke mark, and scratch it in. Okay, so this is component three you're looking at. So this is the bottom component, and this component is going to be nesting in the top of it. So that means that this area here is the waist. Uh, what I've done here is written the name of each joint on each corner of the component, so I have less of a chance of messing it up later. And what we're going to do, we've obviously got these knife lines here, we're going to square these down the front and back of this component. So again, doing this really accurately, knife in the edge, slide the square up to it and drag back. Go to around halfway, you can go a little bit beyond it if you want, and just make this a really light mark. And again on here. Okay, and then on the other side here. Okay, so that's squared down front and back, and now we can set up a marking gauge to determine how far down we want to go. Now this, because we're referencing off the face side, doesn't matter too much if you get it spot on or not, because any error is gonna cancel itself out, but we might as well get it spot on. An easy way to do this is just sort of eyeball it, lock the marking gauge down, go in from one side, do a little mark, go in from the other, do a little mark, and if they touch, it means that it's spot on, so I need to bring it out a little bit more. So I've got a micro adjust on this marking gauge here. I did a tool duel between this marking gauge and the Veritas marking gauge, so this is a tight mark. If you're interested in seeing that, there is a link up here to watch that. And there we go, that's spot on. So now I'm going to reference it off the face side that I've got here, so stock against that, and we're going to scratch between those two lines that we've got. There's that side done, and I'm going to flip it over and do the other side, so still referencing off the face side. That is all waste and that is a waste. Okay, now the end of component four to be nested into that. Because this is the waste, that means the underside of component four is going to be the waste. So this is where some people will get mixed up with the marking gauge. They'll see the waste here and they'll reference the marking gauge off of that waste bit. However, the face side is on this side. The waist is on here. You're always going to be referencing off this face side. So stock is pressed against that and we're going to drag it round all three faces on the end of this, going up to the shoulder line that we scratched on previously. So we'll flip it over and come from this side now. Okay, so let's just make the waist a little bit clearer. So all of that, all of that, all of that, and that there is all the waste. Right, so the lap joint is all marked out, ready to go. Do not change the setting on your marking gauge because we are going to use that to mark out the dovetail halving joint. So let's do that now. Right, dovetail halving joint is on the top of component two. And I can see on the drawing that the components are 44 millimeters wide and the top of the dovetail is 38. So the difference between 38 and 44 is six. That means that we have to go in three millimeters, so half of six from either side basic maths. Then I'm going to square those down. And now we're going to use a sliding bevel, so this is like an adjustable square, to mark out the dovetail shape on here. Now, we do dovetails with ratios, so you do one in eight, one in six, so that's like one unit across, six units up, one unit across, eight units up, and that's going to give you different levels of steepness for the dovetails. There is a lot of talk about there, a lot of conflict about what dovetail ratio is right. I did a video based around this a couple of weeks ago, and I'll put the link in the top right corner for that. Essentially, you can choose anything between one in eight and one in four. You've just got to choose what fits the application the best. So for this, I'm probably gonna do a one in eight ratio, because if I do a one in six, it's gonna taper quite a lot, and it might leave it a little bit thin towards the bottom of the shoulder line here whereas a one in eight is going to leave a little bit more width at the bottom. So for this application, I think that's going to be the best. Okay, so line that bevel up with the end grain and draw the line down the front. So my explanation there for setting up the sliding bevel was a little bit rushed. So if you want to know a little bit more about that, be sure to watch my video, How to Cut a Dovetail Joint, because I had a little segment in that where I showed you how to set up the sliding bevel. So link is in the top right corner for that now. So here I'm just slightly adjusting the sliding bevel so that the pen line meets up with the end grain, which it does now. Right, and then using the same marking gauge, referencing off the face side on this, we're going to score a line all the way around the edge of this dovetail joint. Okay, and that means, because that's the front, that means all of this is waste. So there's that ready to go, and now we can get component one, which is where the dovetail is going to be cut on here. And then because these are just pencil lines on this dovetail one, I'm just going to square those down just to give me some sort of boundary. Marking gauge on the face side, drag it back between those marks. 
Okay, so that's the dovetail marked out. That's as far as we can go with that now because we're going to need to cut out the dovetail first and then mark the dovetail into this component here. So we're not going to do that yet. We're going to continue marking out. The next one we're going to do is the bridle joint. So in close with that. Okay, so on the bridle joint here, we've obviously got our two knife lines that we marked out when we were marking out the half lap earlier on. And we've got to transfer these two lines around all four sides. So I'm going to do that now. Again, referencing the stock of the square off the face side the entire time or the face edge the entire time. Okay, that is squared all the way around on all four sides. So now we have got a mortise gauge here. So this is a marking gauge with two heads on it. And I've spaced these to divide this component exactly into three. So this is 24 millimeters thick. That means divide into three parts is eight millimeters. Now this is convenient because when we use this marking gauge for the mortise and tenon later on, eight millimeters is the exact size of my mortising chisel that I'm going to use for that. So bear that in mind because if you want the bridle joint to be exactly the same size as the mortise and tenon joint, you're going to have to space this bridle joint based around the size of your chisel here. So say if this component was 20 millimeters thick as opposed to 24, you're gonna to have to go in six millimeters either side in order to get eight millimeters in the middle there. But like I say, we're lucky with this, 24 is divisible by three and it's eight millimeters exactly the size as this mortise chisel. So my bridle joint and my my mortise and tenon joint that I'll be marking out after this will be exactly the same size. Now this mortise gauge I'm referencing off the face side of course and I'm going to scratch these lines independently. Don't be tempted to stab both wheels in at the same time because it makes it a little bit more difficult to control. So just do one of them and then flip it around and do the other one. Now with the heads on these mortise gauges these have little chamfers on them and these chamfers are going into the waist sides of this bridle joint. So that means that the middle section here that we're keeping has a nice square wall on it and then these outer bits have sort of a taper into them like that. And so we'll do that on the other side now. So round here, referencing off the face side which is now on here. Okay and then mark the waist on that. Right and now let's do it on the tenon at the end. So just double check in one, four, that means it's going on here. Stock on the face side. I'm going to keep saying it throughout this whole thing because it's really important. Once again, we're going to use these heads independently and square that line all the way around. Now this time, the chamfers are going into the bit of material that we want to keep. Now this isn't too much of an issue here because these are all going to be hidden by the walls on this joint, so that doesn't matter. However, on the end grain here, the fact that it's sloping into the material we're keeping could provide a little V-groove that might turn into a shadow gap or something like that. And that is why I left the component about half a millimetre or one millimetre oversized when I was marking out this shoulder line. It means that I'm going to have excess material here that I can plane off at the end and get rid of that little V-groove that's left over. Okay, and for this, the material wastage is going to be in the middle. Don't be tempted to accidentally mark the wrong side here because then you're going to end up with two, well, two of the same component and it's not going to go together, obviously. So always, always mark your waist with this. Right, bridle joint all marked out. So now the fourth and final joint to mark out is the through tenon in the bottom right corner. So in close with that now. Right, so the width of the through tenon that goes through here is, let's have a look, 34 millimeters. So that means with these components being 44 mil, we need to come in five millimeters from either side. And so to do that, I've got 50 millimeters in from the end here, and I'm gonna do 34 millimeters, so the width of the tenon plus five millimeters, so that would be 39. So I'm gonna line 39 millimeters up with this line here, and I'm going to mark five millimeters in from that, so 34 little mark there and then one at zero. So there we go, that's giving us a little pencil mark and then with the square on the face edge on the back side here, knife in that pencil mark, drag it back. Now this you want to be extremely accurate with because through tenons, very difficult to get spot on because you're going from here and you're hoping that it's gonna line up perfectly on this side. So the more accurate you do this, the higher chance you have of it being exposed nicely on the back end here. Right, and there we go, that should be a 34 millimetre distance. Yep, so 34 millimetres there, 34 there, 34 on there. And now we're gonna get the mortise case that we just set up and mark along here. However, the chamfers on these are now going into the material we want to keep. So I'm just going to flip those around quickly. So one of them is at eight millimetres, lock that down. And then the other one, I'm going to space with my mortise chisel. Okay, that looks all right. So now marking off the face side, obviously, make sure these are properly locked down. So there you go, that's the outside marked, and let's do the inside quickly. Okay, so there, 
is our waste. Don't want any of that. And that's going straight through. So that's going to be exposed on both sides. Now what we can do is get component two, which is going to be nested in it like that. And I'm going to line up the corner of this with the pencil mark that I drew on there originally. So 50 millimeters in. You could also get the ruler and just measure it like that but I'm pretty confident on that pencil mark. So get that on there. And then using the knife lines that I've just squared across the top here, I'm going to transfer that onto the tenon. So just with a small mark there, small mark there. And to mark this out, you might be tempted to perhaps get a square on the end grain like that and square it down, square on the end grain, square it down. But then you are relying on that end grain to be perfectly square. If it's not, for example, you might end up skewing your tenon that way or skewing it that way. You can never be too certain. So what I'm going to do here is get a spare marking gauge and I'm going to reference it off the face edge here and I'm going to score down here, reset it and then score down here. So then I know that it's perfectly parallel to the face edge, which we've been marking these square marks off. Could be seen as a little bit overkill, but I want this to go together pretty perfect. So I'm going to get that lined up with the little mark that I've just put in there. Square that all the way along and obviously around the end grain as well, down the opposite face on there. And then I'm going to reset it. So get it pressed up against the face edge again, locate it on that other mark and square that around too. Okay, and let's just do a quick visual check to make sure they all line up. So, sorry, it's going on that side. So knife line there, all line up perfectly. So now we're just gonna use the mortise gauge and we're gonna square the lines all the way around the end grain here, referencing off the face side. Okay, and then looking at the end grain, we've got waste all the way along here, all the way around the edge here, all the way around here, all the way around here, and there we go. Got a little tenon in the middle. And there we go. I think we're going to stop it there for now. Um, if you're following along with this, just take your time with the marking out. So many people rush this process and wonder why you get rubbish results at the end. It's because you're rushing this. There's no point working accurately to inaccurate lines because that doesn't make it accurate. So next video, we're going to start cutting them out. I will see you then.